All right, hey, welcome everybody to yet another journal club brought to you by Life Extension Advocacy Foundation, LEAF and Lifespan.io um, here at Cooper Union uh, in the city of New York. Um, I'm Dr. Alvin Medvedic, joining me is Steve Hill and Fatima in the background controlling our broadcast here and we are bringing you yet a, another wonderful journal club. Um, this uh, article that we're discussing today um, actually was presented, or big chunks of it, uh, of, was presented by Dr. Vera Gorbanova at our conference. Um, hopefully, uh, some of you listening were able to join us in the flesh at our conference from that was uh, this, well, actually this month, uh, July 11th and 12th, um, here at the Cooper Union, along with a workshop on the 10th uh, held by Dr. Kelsey Moody. Um, it was, as far as I'm concerned, it was a uh, rousing success. We had um, 200 participants. Uh, we had a lot of speakers. Um, we're still working, I think, decompressing all the all the audio visual stuff that we have. And we will be putting that up somewhere um, that's accessible to everybody. So all the wonderful speakers and talks and discussions that we had, the panel discussions, that's going to be available as soon as we can get it all up. Because um, right now we're trying to, you know, uh, make sure that it's all edited correctly and, um, you know, and uh, it's enjoyable for everybody to listen in and uh, view. So, um, so this uh, paper that we're discussing here, it's actually, I was just mentioning to Steve that it's probably, uh, if not my most favorite papers thus far at, in, during the Journal Club, not, not, not to say that all the other papers we covered weren't good, they were um, all very good. Um, but this one here, you know, um, it's it's a I enjoy it particularly because it's you know it, it uh, as a biologist it goes right into the science. Um, it basically invokes evolutionary biology. I think it ties up a whole bunch of loose threads um, in um, aging and longevity research. Um, as just basically has a ton of great authors, and um, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to actually do justice to this paper. We might think. Steve was mentioning we might actually have to revisit this as a, as a panel discussion. Is that what we're calling it, a panel discussion with some of the, uh, you know, online with some of the authors? Um, just because, you know, it is a cell paper um, and there's a lot of supplemental data that we're not going to be able to get through right now. Um, so I just want to go through like the major highlights and kind of the major implications of this paper and go through some of the, some of the data here. Um, but the paper, and I'm going to basically share it right now, screen share. Um, this paper is on um, sirtuins, and particularly uh, sirt 6 or SIRT6, um, which is basically um, a mammalian homolog of, I believe, yeast SIRT2. You know, um, my former PI, Dr. David Sinclair, um, obviously cut his teeth on sirtuins. Um, so, you know, uh, a lot of you listening have already, you know, have been following the field of sirtuins and their importance in aging. And this paper really kind of, I think, cements a lot of what's been, um, what's been published previously and kind of takes it, you know, pole vaults into the next level. Um, and I'm just going to scroll up here. This is a nice summary, you know, figure here for this entire paper. So, the, you know, the title, as you can read, is Sir T6 is responsible for more efficient DNA double strand break repair in long-lived species. Um, the lead author is Xiao Qian, and there's a you know a ton of authors here, people that we know. Uh, there's Betty Bladishev, uh, Brian Kennedy, Kelsey Moody, um, Andre Selyanov, Vera Gorbanova, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's uh, you know it's a pretty heavyweight cast of people, and um, I think the data is pretty solid. And um, there's a lot of uh, stuff here to unpack. So. Uh, like I said, this is, would be great to do a follow-up. But basically, the bottom line is, um, you know, SIRT6 uh, is an enzyme that's, um, it has a number of different roles. It's uh, important for DNA repair, um, among other things. Uh, it's a histone deacetylase. Um, so, uh, it's, so it has a, so it, it acts as a deacetylase. It's an NAD-dependent deacetylase, but it also has ADP ribosyl transferase activity. Um, so basically, in a nutshell, you know, these are modifications, these are chemical modifications that uh, this enzyme, um, you know, does on other proteins. So it either attaches a, you know, um, a, uh, 
a small chemical, um, ADP ribose, um, uh, monoribose, to, um, to other proteins and activates them or it deacetylates so it removes an acetyl group so you know so this is its its function um and its switching function is related to basically turning things on and off that regulate um dna um repair uh particularly double strand break repair so what they did in this paper is uh they looked at cells from a whole bunch of different rodents um that basically have different lifespans ranging from you know short lifespans of mice all the way at the left here um you know about two years to you know uh i guess naked mole rats and beavers beavers living many you know, a couple of decades at least um and you know they went you know uh quite far in, in correlating you know um the lifespan of all of these different rodents um with uh sir t6 activity Right? So there was a nice correlation between SIR-T6 activity um, as measured in double strand break repair and, you know, and particularly the enzymatic activity of his, its deacetylase functionality and its AB, uh, ADP ribosylation activity. Uh, and then they correlated that with, with lifespan. And they were able to do some really cool molecular biology where they were able to then transfer um, the regions because nobody was able, you know, I think this paper is the first paper where they actually sequenced uh, the different uh, cert, uh, cert sixes uh, from the different species, and looked at the region that was, in, was zoomed in, and particularly in five amino acids that was responsible, uh, you know, evolutionarily that evolved um, better activities. So they're able to do molecular analysis, uh, enzymatic analysis, and show that this, you know, just swapping those regions was able to um, improve its. Uh, double strand break repair activity. And then later in the paper, they actually then, I think, overexpress or express, uh, uh, you know, the beaver version of SIR-T6 in Drosophila and managed to get an extended lifespan. So, um, so really cool evolutionary work. And this paper also, and I'm gonna just jump ahead where, I, you know, again, uh, I mentioned that this paper, is, you know, seeks to tie up loose ends. They, you know, the double strand break repair activity correlates with lifespan, but they showed that um, nucleotide, nucleotide excision repair, so basically um, base excision repair, you know, um, any kind of bulky, anything that basically happens to bases, which is usually a result of ultraviolet light, uh, such as cross-linking, I believe, you know, formation of thymidine dimers. So nucleotide excision repair did not um, correlate with lifespan, um, but they were able to, you know, show that it was correlated with um, the environment, the lifestyle, environmental lifestyle of various, you know, rodents. So whether they basically were nocturnal or diurnal, you know, depending on how much sun exposure they evolved with. So, so they were able to show that the nucleotide excision repair um, pathways were distinct from, you know, the activity did not correlate with lifespan, but correlated more with, with the environmental effects at which the organisms evolved. And um, that tied up some loose sense because in the page paper they mentioned there were, there were controversies in the past where people said, well, you know, you kind of lump the DNA damage, you know, together and DNA repair together and you say, well, you know, DNA repair in general goes up with long lived, but in some cases when you look at certain specific types of DNA repair, such as nucleotide excision repair, it, it doesn't correlate with lifespan. So what's going on? Is DNA repair correlate with lifespan? Does it not correlate with lifespan? So there's a lot of confusion. And I think they, they went a, a really a nice, nice step forward in kind of starting to tease this apart and saying, well, this is why evolutionarily, you know, um, DNA repair pathways that are, in, that, are, that are activated by intrinsic damage, right? That's not due to environmental effects um co-evolved with lifespan but uh repair pathways that are more uh you know co-evolved with exposure to you know um environmental insults such as high uv damage um not necessarily co-evolved with lifespan because um you know it's it's uh it's a different evolutionary pressure that's taking place um so anyway this is a nice figure that basically summarizes the, the bulk of of the um kind of the paper's results. So I'm gonna stop sharing here for a moment. Okay. Whew. So 
that's that's a lot of stuff. Um, you know, you could probably have a, a couple of teased this apart into a couple of papers, um, but uh, but it's all in there. So <clears throat> so okay. So let's take a look at uh, some of the data that they have. So these are the highlights. So anyway, I, th I think the journals are doing this now more and more, um, particularly Cell, where they have in one page a nice one page or summary of a graphical abstract and highlights, which um, you know summarizes the whole gist of everything. So there it is. Um, so let's scroll. So they do a number of different assays. So basically, these assays are to determine uh, whether or not uh, well, whether or not um, DNA damage repair correlates with lifespan. And let me go to the figure here, because it's, sorry, it's a little uh, figure legends. So first they show that the nucleotide excision repair, as I mentioned before, does not correlate with maximal lifespan in 18 rodent species. So they do this host cell reactivation assay. So they basically take cells, they basically have cell cultures um, from all of these different organisms. And they basically, um, they, uh, use ultraviolet light to induce this particular type of damage um, in basically these apoplasmid, right? So this is a reporter plasmid that has firefly luciferase um, and any mutations that don't get repaired, you don't have expression of firefly luciferase, which is in the greenish spectrum. And then they have as a control ranilla luciferase, which is in the reddish spectrum, right? And then they basically, basically it's a ratio of, of, of how much, uh, you know, repair you have of expression of firefly luciferase, and this is you know depending on how much any joules of ultraviolet radiation you zap zap the plasma with, right? And then you co-transfect this into the cells from the different um, the different rodents, right? So here they have 400 joules per square meter UV or 1,200 joules per square meter, um, and they look at so and this is you know um, uh, log base to maximum lifespan. So I think this is going from what is this you know from zero to like 30 something years of, of life, right? Uh, so basically everything from a mouse to a beaver um, and luciferase reactivation as a percentage and they have R squared and P values um, and they're kind of all over the place uh, showing that, you know, in general, you don't have a significant difference. Uh, here's a UV LD50, meaning that, uh, you know, that, higher and higher, I think this is where they, they scroll down here, um, across three sunlight exposure groups. So they also look at the resistance to, I think they zap also the cells here, um, and they show that you know this, the, um, the longer lived cells were in general more resistant to UV damage, um, or maybe this is, um, I'm trying to scroll through here, sorry. Sunlight. Oh, sunlight exposure groups. My apologies. So low, medium, high. So these are actually, so we're not looking at, um, so low, medium, high are cells from that, you know, were, uh, so I'm jumping ahead of myself here. So let me just stick to my, stick to the figure here. So B and C are looking at lifespan. So there's no correlation with lifespan um, as far as luciferase active, uh, you know, reactivation is concerned. But what you do see is luciferase reactivation correlate with um, categories of rodents that basically co-evolved in low, medium, or high? So basically, you know, low light light levels would be you know nocturnal. High would be basically diurnal. So rodents like beavers that live out in the uh, you know um, that are most active in bright sunlight. And then medium is well, medium. I guess they they uh, they split their time between night and night and uh, day. So what you have is the reactivation of the reporter gene correlates most strongly with basically um, the environmental lifestyle of the rodent, but not with the maximal lifespan, right? So this is nucleotide excision repair. So that's their, that's their kind of, that's the assay that they did. You know, that's the type of assay that they did for, you know, it's very simple, very straightforward. Um, you know, they, they grew cell, cell lines from, you know, cell cultures from uh, that they uh, develop primary cells from each of these rodents and um, did the assay. And it's, you know, it's a nice straightforward correlation where they have with, uh, with uh, 
with the environmental um, you know, habitat of the organism, but not the lifespan, right? So, um, and that's something they mentioned later in the paper where, you know, you had contradictory data in the past looking at, um, looking at nucleotide excision repair and some, some papers showing a, a correlation and some, pe some papers not. And what they pointed out was that you could, you know, this, this confusion was basically resolved if you looked at, you know, whether or not the authors used, you know, um, organisms that were um, nocturnal or diurnal or, you know, or maybe they had, it was, it, it, they couldn't find a correlation because they used organisms that were, you know, they were cross comparing organisms that uh, co-evolved in different, you know, um, light habitats, so to speak. Right. So, okay. I'm going to take a little breather here. Any questions? Any comments? Any? I think everything's quiet on the chat front right now. Uh, all quiet on the Western Front, sir. There's nothing, oh. uh, nothing going on at the moment. But uh, okay. anybody who, who's got comments or questions about the paper so far, do chime in. We love, a, we love a discussion. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I mean, it's very interesting in general. I'm just, I, yeah. I, I found it is equally fascinating. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to uh, actually seeing the video uh, of Vera in action at the conference as well. I did see her give a talk in Berlin, as I'm sure you may have as well. Um, so, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it is really fascinating. And as I was saying to you earlier before we started, the NAD connection is, is, is particularly interesting for me here, you know, in this paper, because a lot of people um, say that, David Sinclair, who we, we mentioned earlier, um, he, he wasted his time with sirtuins and it went nowhere. But now the knowledge is coming together with NAD and sirtuins and how they interact and rely on each other. For me, it's really sort of building on what David did all those years ago. And now it makes it clear as to why it's so important. So, Well, I'm going to... Yeah, I'm going to make a, just a general blanket comment here, with, which I think is, I think the data holds up. And I think this is, this is a general, a generalization for, um, you know, longevity um, pathways in general. Um, I like to refer to, you know, longevity pathways rather than, you know, aging pathways, just because, um, you know, from my perspective as, as a biologist, um, it's pathways that maintain longevity that evolved rather than aging per se, um, mm. things break down for a variety of reasons and they break down and, you know, you have an increase in entropy and it could be due to intrinsic, um, which is, you know, I would, I would kind of put that into, you know, let's put that, say that's true aging, you know, um, mechanisms versus extrinsic, which could be a variety of toxic insults. Um, and, and an organism to maintain homeostasis had to evolve a variety of systems to basically prevent it from dying, right? Just to put it bluntly. And even if you knock out every extrinsic insult, like, you know, nucleotide, you know, UV light, for example, you still have, uh, you know, intrinsic, you know, uh, mechanisms at play, production of free radicals, all kinds of stuff that happens just, just due to metabolism. Um, that's going to degrade not only, you know, um, just, your random, but all your molecules, all your polymers, uh, but you know it's all, but but it's also going to degrade the polymers that maintain the repair. So the repair processes themselves break down, and eventually it gets to a point where where you call that aging, which means that you, you get to a point where essentially your fitness starts to decline over a period, period of time. And basically, what what I would point out is, and this paper points out, and Beer's work actually in the past number of years have pointed out is, um, you know, a lot of these, I would expect, and, and it's certainly true for the sirtuins, um, the sirtuin class of enzymes, which are heavily involved in, in repair and in basically mitigating, the, the, you know, the, the, the um, processes of aging are evolutionarily very ancient. I mean, you find them in yeasts, you find them in unicellular organisms, you find them in long-lived rodents, you find them in humans, you pretty much find them everywhere. So, you know, you know, I would, I would, uh, I would predict, and I don't think this is a bold prediction. It probably is borne out already from, from the literature out there that um, longevity maintaining mechanisms or pathways <clears throat> are probably the most evolutionarily ancient um, uh, across.
across the board. Um, you know, I would say that everything alive that has to metabolize to maintain homeostasis, um, you know, is, is going to build up some sort of um, toxic side products, um, you know, just categorize it in one big bucket called damage. Mm -hmm. And that damage is, is uh, if that damage is not, um, if there's no pathways that have evolved to mitigate that damage, um, you know, homeostasis is quickly lost and organism is dead and it's an evolutionary dead end at that point. Hmm. So I would, I would say that, <clears throat> you know, for that reason, I would say that longevity, mechanism, maintaining pa pathways, you know, thing, you know, mechanisms to uh, reset the clock, rejuvenate the cell are, I would say, probably the most evolutionarily, you know, uh, conserved and um, oldest extent you know, pathways across every organism on planet Earth. Um, I'm kind of pointing it out there because I know that there's there's viewpoints out there where people mention that aging has evolved, or you know, it's some. It, I, I take I, I I do not subscribe to the any programmed uh, hypotheses or theories of, of aging. Um, I think I think what has evolved is um, longevity mechanisms or or um, or basically lack thereof, right? So if you don't have any mechanism to maintain longevity or repair damage that accumulates, um, if you knock out any of these pathways, um, you know, it may look like programmed aging because mm -hmm. you deactivate those longevity pathways and things spiral quickly out of control for, for a cell. And it looks like a self-destruct switch has been hit. Um, but anyway, that's my two cents. And I think, I think the, the data um, as it comes in year after year bears that out. And certainly um, we're seeing that with, with, with enzymes like the sirtuin class of enzymes, which are indeed um, evolutionarily very ancient. Anyway, um, and rant back to yeah. I think I think we both broadly agree on that. Um, and definitely the data supports it more and more. Program, we are programmed to die. I really, I can't get on board with it. Um, I think I think David, uh, just to go off on a slight tangent briefly, but uh, David Gems, I'm sure you may you may have met David at some point. He has a very interesting sort of hypothesis that supports the idea of not only damage and or error, but also has that 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 aging follows what he calls quasi um, program. It's not a program per se, but it looks like a program. And I think quasi programs, you know, is plausible. So people from the outside have looked in and gone, oh, look, we're programmed to die. No, not really. It's just things interact in a programmed like manner. But it isn't that you're programmed to die. But that's a whole other episode right there. Anywho, mm. um, let, uh, let's see. OK, this is the I always have too many windows open. So now, so now we are back to the paper. Um, and we are scrolling into, I believe, now we are seeing a correlation with, um, so figure two um, is the correlation we have been waiting for. The efficiency of DNA double strand break repair positively correlates with maximal lifespan. Um, so I'd like to, I'd like to ask, they mentioned, the, they mentioned, um, uh, they do a lot of really um, deep statistical analyses to make, you know, to basically make sure that this correlation is strictly due to uh, SIR-T6 and the repair, and not any other types of confounding variables because they're different species of rodents. And um, uh, I'm not qualified to go too deep into those statistical analyses. So that's something that, you know, um, remind me if I forget, this is something that I'd love to talk to the authors about um, when we actually do um, the, uh, the roundtable discussion or the uh, seminar, the webinar. Um, okay, so double strand break repair. So unlike the plateide excision repair where you have like bulky adducts, you know, that's just means um, things stuck, glommed onto DNA, cross links, that kind of stuff due to UV light. Um, here, you know, you have through um, a variety of internal insults that happen, you know, in the cell, you have uh, double strand breaks happen. So, you know, DNA either, you know, can get nicked single strand happens and then the DNA is more prone to getting another break and you have um, breakages in the DNA and there's two main pathways that 
resolve this. One is called non-homologous enjoining, NHEJ. The other one is called homologous recombination. Um, and they both have their kind of idiosyncrasies and quirks. Um, one is much more reliable, and I think it's a bit slower, which is homologous recombination, where you make, where you have to have a template. So, so here we have the reporter gene again. So they're using cells, and they're using these reporter genes. So basically, for non-homologous enjoining, um, they induce a break by using this endonuclease called um, IS1, IS, ISC1. Um, it basically it's it, you know recognizes a long sequence of of of, bait, of uh, bases um, that's not found anywhere else you know in the genome, so they can basically cut for you know cut exactly where they want it to cut, um, kind of like CRISPR does, except you know you have to engineer this site there, right? So it's and once that break is done, the cell is like, oh god, there's a break. We got to fix this, right? So that's you know obviously the cell isn't saying that or maybe it is. But I don't know. I mean, philosophically, it's it's doing it. It's equivalent of oh. There's a break, so it needs to then recruit a whole bunch of DNA repair enzymes that are, you know, that are involved in NHEJ and HR, which we'll later see involve CERT six upstream of both. Um, and this break has to be fixed. If it's not fixed, um, basically, you know, you have this. Uh, so they have this intronic sequence here uh, between um, the, the the GFP and for the homologous recombination, there's no intronic sequence, but this break that gets induced over here, there's, you know, um, there's delta 22, meaning that there's 22 bases are missing. So for the cell to repair this, basically it has to copy this G um, that's missing an ATG. So there's a start sequence over here and the GFP is basically, you know, um, expressed. Uh, over here for this break to get, uh, for non-homologous enjoining uh, to take place. Um, if this break is repaired, essentially what happens is that this intronic sequence gets spliced out normally and the GFP is then expressed, right? So over here, there's no template to be you know, copied from. Over here, there is a template. So homologous recombination, the bottom line is it requires a template to copy, um, you know, to repair the copy. And they put this delta 22 here to make sure that only homologous recombination is measured and not NHEJ. Because if NHEJ repaired this, so NHEJ basically is like a, a rapid way to fix breaks. And if it, uh, and sometimes there's a nucleotide or two missing, which it doesn't matter here because it's, uh, you know, there's a um, intron that gets spliced out. But if NHEJ repairs this, um, this delta 22 is not going to put anything in frame, and this GFP is still dead. So the only way to get an active GFP um, is for um, homologous recombination to copy the sequence over here, right? So basically, this reporter measures homologous recombination. HR works, you get GFP expressed. If NHEJ works here, you get GFP expressed, right? If NHEJ doesn't work, you have breaks happen here, the cells die, and basically you have no expression. So um, so here, again, you have, uh, I think these are fibroblasts. Um, yeah, low passive skin and lung fibroblasts um, from a variety of different uh, rodents. Um, it's a similar assay that was done from the previous uh, figure. Um, they're basically looking at, you know, they're using, uh, I don't think they show it here, but they have a, they have a control plasmid that um, has uh, red fluorescence, uh, or, sorry, um, DS red. I think uh, I think it's um, well, it's a reporter that uh, that basically causes the cells to fluoresce red, uh, so it's a positive control. So basically, you're looking at um, how much GFP is being re-expressed, right? So log uh, base two maximal lifespan, so one through six, so you know zero through thirty, you know something years of lifespan. So you have your your um, your long-lived critters on this end, and NHEJ efficiency, right? So here the reporter with NH non-homologous enjoining, so skin fibroblasts, lung fibroblasts, and also now homologous recombination efficiency, skin fibroblasts, lung fibroblasts. And uh, you see a correlation, right? So they have p-values here, pretty low. Um, and, you know, there's a line that fits through, and it correlates, right? So you have you have uh, you have 
efficiency basically, you know, which, where you did not see, you know, if we just contrast it with over here, you don't see a correlation with, with uh, nucleotide excision repair for luciferase reactivation. Um, so this is a nice assay, you know, this is a nice, you know, and they say mentioned here experiments repeated three times for each cell line, cells from at least three animals were assayed for each species, right? So, um, so uh, perhaps, you know, people can point out some criticisms, um, you know, uh, and, you know, because it's, you know, it's an experiment, it's not done in animals, it's in, in tissue culture, but, um, but the correlation is there based on their, you know, based on the experiment that they've, that they've, uh, and their assay that they've um, put together uh, for these, um, you know, for these rodents. Um, and it's, uh, I'm looking at these, you know, you know, there might be a couple of outliers, I'm not few here and there, but overall, um, it looks like a pretty decent fit. Um, so that's pretty good. Um, so I'm going to scroll here. Well, maybe I'll. So this is basically sequence data. So I'm going to stop sharing. Um, so I don't know if anybody has any questions, but these are, you know, this is pretty good. They, you know, they took cells directly out of, out of all of these, um, all of these uh, animals, um, uh, all rodents, um, and uh, and the main difference between all of these rodents, besides being um, diurnal and nocturnal, and I like that they actually address that, right? Because you know, um, I don't know what other differences they are that are major between these these um, obviously body masses, and they met, they they mention also that they they controlled for body mass, and body mass was not a um, was not the uh, what you might call it um, body mass did not necessarily correlate I think with the repair it wasn't it wasn't due to body mass um, per se it was due to um, due to uh, other reasons to longevity um, now that being said I think maybe you can you can control for body mass because um, I think I don't see on here but, um, let's see if they look at gray squirrel porcupine um, gray squirrels are pretty pretty small um they live longer than mice um, um i don't see a bat on there bats live pretty long right and bats are pretty tiny like a mouse so i would i would predict that if i if i put a mouse and a bat head to head that a bat should have like pretty pretty good cert c6 activity and probably pretty good double strand break repair activity and you would have obviously no no difference really in body mass between uh, a house mouse or a hamster and a bat, but, uh, but anyway, there's a, there's a lot of follow-up experiments that could be, be done here, but I think they laid the groundwork um, pretty nicely, um, set a pretty high bar for, uh, uh, Keith says, bats I think also have freaky telomere dynamics too. Um, perhaps, um, mice have extremely long telomeres too, which also tend to shrink pretty quickly too, but I think we could probably, I think we could, I think what they're looking at, I don't know what the telomere dynamics are for all of these guys as well. Um, I think they're trying to look at, they don't mention telomeres at all. I think what they're trying to look at is just double strand break repair. Um, so, um, you know, be interesting to see regardless how bats do head to head. Um, but okay, let's take a look, share this. Um, um, and uh, I don't have time here to Google it, but I'm, if somebody can explain to me what the, um, what's strange about bat telomeres, um, I, have to, I have to look that up. I don't, uh, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, okay. So anyway, so they looked at the sequences um, and they, they looked, you know, there's obviously, there's a lot of sequence conservation, um, a lot of similarity, but they basically zoomed in on a region where, um, I think it was in the C terminal um, between, you know, nucleotides 220 and 270. There are five amino acid differences. So these are just basically sequence similarities, you know, with the amino acids um, uh, that are that are highlighted that are different um, between the house mouse, which is the shortest lived, and the naked mole rat, which is um, which is uh, the longest lived. Um, and 
So that is figure legend on next page. That's actually figure three, alignment of rodents through T6 proteins. Um, okay, so that's just an alignment. So now they're looking at SIRT6 directly, and they hypothesize that you know, uh, you know, they're they're looking at SIRT6 because uh, clearly it, um, you know, it's a, it's a very well conserved enzyme. It's also upstream of uh, of both HR and NHEJ. Um, I trying to look through here to see what other reasoning they looked at um, to focus on SIRT6. Those two are you know pretty pretty strong reasons to look at SIRT6. Um, uh, we sought to interrogate the repair upstream. Okay, so it's nuclear localized. Uh, yeah, both NHP and repair. So, um, you know, so they focus on SIRT6. Um, probably doesn't mean that SIRT6 is the only thing that, that correlates, uh, you know, with, with double strand break repair and longevity, but um, it's very well conserved in its upstream of both. So this is what they chose to look at. And uh, later they show that uh, it is, uh, you know, the significant driver of the longevity here. So uh, what do they do here, figure four? I have to remind myself, because it's been a week since I read this. SIRT6 ability to stimulate double strand break positively correlates with species maximal lifespan. Um, ah, okay, so they were overexpressing uh, HPRT, which is just a control, um, or SIRT6. Um, and let's see, which SIRT6 were they overexpressing? I have to remind myself here. Uh, so this is basically NHEJ, so similar assay as before, so using basically, you know, uh, the GFP plasmids, fold stimulation by SIRT6, so NHEJ stimulation and homologous recombination stimulation. Um, oh, so I think what they're doing here, and this is, um, this is a lot of work, <laughs> so there's a lot of cloning here. Uh, so this is overexpression of the variety, the different SIRT6s from, that were cloned from all of these different rodents. Um, so that's, uh, that's a lot of cloning. So there's a lot of cloning that takes place here. This is just a control blot, a Western blot, to show that they're actually producing the different SIRT T6s uh, that are flag tagged, beta tubular control, um, house, mouse, hamster, rat, gerbil, naked mole rat, gray squirrel, beaver, paca, chinchilla. Anyway, um, so all of this different expression, and they show that, uh, you know, that you get this correlation you know, and here are the numbers. Um, you have a correlation with uh, overexpression uh, or expression of SIRT6 uh, from a same similar plasmid, sim um, uh, actually, wait, yeah, similar plasmids, similar, you know, so these are all controlled, so similar promoters. Um, but the only difference between all of this and all of these uh, data points is that you have uh, SIRT6 from different rodents, right? So. Um, if you saw a flat line or an inverse correlation, that would be bad. But no, you see a positive correlation, right? So that's that's some very good, um, you know, data there. You know, basically um, showing showing in this assay that not only do these long-lived rodents have uh, improved NHEJ and improved um, homologous recombination. Um, but if you over if you express SIRT6 from these different species um, in their HR whoops in their HR stimulation assay, and I think they use um, they use rat cells. I think they mentioned here that they tried to express this in mouse cells, but the the, the you know uh, for some reason the the milieu of the mouse cells didn't give um, didn't give the best. Uh, they couldn't see an increase in HR or NHEJ, so they had to use a slightly longer lived rodent as a, as a, as a host cell. And that was a rat. Um, and, uh, when they did that, uh, you do see a correlation between, um, you know, between, uh, uh, maximal, you know, uh, correlation between the maximal lifespan of, uh, you know, of, of the organism where you derive the CERT2, the CERT C6 from and the amount of, uh, molecular recombination and NHEJ that, uh, took place as a result of this reporter assay. Um, so pretty good correlation. You know, you could probably throw in some additional negative controls. Maybe they did their way overexpressing these different systems in longer lived cells, but um, you know, and you would expect to not really see much of a difference, but they did sort of that, you know, accidentally using mouse cells and they didn't see much of a difference because they were too short lived and, um, 
or didn't or their their HR their other enzymes were were not conducive to um, improving significantly. I think the HR or the or the an HEJ in this in this particular assay. Um, so you know that suggests to me that there's additional enzymes that uh, could be pulled out that can be looked at besides your T6 that can uh, you know that could have co-evolved to um, uh, extend longevity um, in these longer lived organisms. Uh, but anyway, SIR T6 is definitely a good strong candidate um, as they've shown thus far. So, um, so in figure five, what they start to do is they start to do, um, you know, I don't know if, you know, I remember reading, I remember, you know, this is like, this is the type of molecular biology. Um, I don't know if they, people do this, uh, maybe they do this as, as these days as often, but I remember when I was, uh, as an undergraduate, there's a lot of, you know, you would do a lot of constructs where you would basically try to, um, it's sort of uh, divide and conquer of a protein, right? You try to figure out which protein is most, which part of a protein is most important for inducing some sort of function. So you, you take out this region, you take out that region, you swap this region and that region, and you see if the, the activity goes away, right? And you try to narrow down the region that's the most important, which is what they're doing here, until you finally get to, let's say, it's the C-terminal region between amino acids 220 and 270. And then you start looking at um, the amino acid differences between these and then saying, oh, okay, well, there's five amino acids that are different. Now let's start mutating individual amino acids within this region and seeing which ones are the key amino acids. Uh, and that is a summary of basically figure five and figure um, figure six, I believe, um, where basically figure five is looking at different chunks, oops, at different chunks of uh, either beaver or mouse. Um, so very short-lived um, species, very long-lived species, relatively speaking. Um, and they basically look at any, so they have that assay that we spoke about, relative NHEJ efficiency. Um, I think they do, yeah, relative, mm, they do HR efficiency. Maybe they do it later, but I think they're, maybe that's in the supplemental. There's a lot of data in this, but anyway. So this figure shows relative NHEJ efficiency. And uh, there's a control here, which is uh, negative. Um, so expression of mouse wild type. And then this is beaver wild type. So you could see this relative NHEJ efficiency looking at this bar and this bar, you know, fourfold, twofold versus the control, um, which is probably not expressing SIR T6. And that's basically a Western blot showing the expression. And these are various mutants. So they have a code here. Um, so this is the mouse, I believe, N-terminal fused to uh, the C-terminal of beaver. And this is basically starting at amino acid 292. Um, so basically, they're, they're, they're fusing different regions of, and that's in, you know, different regions of the protein between mouse and beaver and seeing which, uh, you know, which region is basically, uh, is important, right? So uh, I have to kind of go through the figure legend to kind of remind myself which region they, they, they zoom in at, but um, well, I could go through this bar graph, but bar graph, but the bottom line is that the region that starts at amino acid 200, 220 and 270, when they do the swap with beaver to mouse, um, it starts to recapitulate um, the beaver profile of NHEJ efficiency, right? So essentially that's, you know, that's, they're basically um, making fusion proteins between the two. Um, and once they, once they identify that it's the region between 220 and 270, that's the fusion protein, you know, by swapping this region from the beaver to the mouse and vice versa, you can get you know elevated levels of NHEJ in you know basically a, a mouse sir T6. That's a mouse sir T6 except for this region, and you can also knock down the, the functionality of sir T6 um, as far as you know measuring the NHEJ efficiency by doing the vice versa swap with you know with uh, mouse to beaver and beaver to mouse, right? So. 
basically doing this type of analysis where you're essentially making different fusion proteins. And so it's a lot of work, a lot of cutting and pasting, um, a lot of cloning, a lot of constructs, and basically a divide and conquer strategy to you know, come up with the region between amino acids 220 and 270 that's um, you know, going, to, uh, going to be the most important for preserving um, non-homologous and joining activity. Um, and again, once they find out it's this region, they can make this, you know, in bigger, uh, this is 4C or 5C, 4C, um, you know, they can see that there's only five amino acids that are different, right? And they can now start mutating these amino acids in, co or in and, and, you know, individually and in combination and showing essentially that um, as you start to mutate these amino acids one by one in the beaver, the, efficient, the effectiveness of this enzyme to, you know, for, to induce this repair you know, uh, process um, diminishes. And if you change these amino acids one by one in the mouse, you get a, you know, you get a uh, similar increase. Um, so I'm gonna just scroll through here where they basically go from looking at regions to essentially looking at um, the individual mutations. So I'm gonna stop sharing here. So. Anyway, um, wanted to spare everyone going through individually bar graph by bar graph, looking at all the chunks. But you know, I just summarized that by saying that's that's essentially um, a divide and conquer type of strategy that you employ with, with proteins to kind of isolate the region that's that's most important. Um, and in the next figure that we're going to look at, you know, they they um, they do predictive modeling of the structure and they try to point out where close to the active site, you know, these supposedly these amino acids might lie. Um, I think they use a, you know, um, I don't think the crystal structure for, for the beaver um, sur T6 is known, or some of them aren't known, but I think they use whichever sur T6s that are conserved, you know, um, maybe human, maybe other ones that are in the, in the uh, databases, and they use that as a kind of a best fit model to um, superimpose and, and see where those mutations, uh, where those five amino acid differences might lie. Um, so I'm gonna share that. They do slightly different assays in the next figure, where SIR-T6 I mentioned is a histone deacetylase and also an ADP ribosylase. So they basically, um, so they look at uh, the histone deacetylase activity um, using um, histone H3 and um, basically the acetylase, um, acetylation status of lysine 9, so that's a target for SIR-T6. Um, they looked at uh, basically another um, region of histone H3. They also look at uh, uh, ribosylation of a, uh, of a target, um, so basically um, they look at uh, poly-ADP ribosylation uh, expression of mouse wild type um, and then a mouse wild type where they induce the five mutations. So what they essentially, what Vera mentioned was, I don't know how she phrased it, but basically it's a, you know, it's a, it's a mouse. The only difference between in this figure, what, they're, what they've done is they've just basically taken a mouse sir T6 sequence and just changed those five amino acids to a beaver five amino acids, right? So that's, they've, they've, they've made it uh, into a, I guess for longevity purposes, a beaver, uh, beaver sir T6, although the rest of it is, is mouse, right? So basically just to, um, you know, um, emphasize that it's those amino acids. And if we look at this figure here, so this is now moving on from just looking at the repair status of sir T6. Um, this is looking at its other enzymatic capabilities. No sir T6, um, so this is an antibody against acetylated, um, acetylated various lysines on histone H3. This is mouse, this is wild type SIR-T6. Um, this is mouse expression of SIR-T6 that has those five mutations. So this is um, a beaver, you know, basically, uh, I guess a beaver longevity mutant version of mouse. And this is beaver wild type. And then this is beaver with the five mutations that convert it into a weaker or a mouse version of 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 sir T6, right? So basically, you you know, as um, you would predict, um, 
you have less acetylated. So this, you know, this seeing um, these bands get dimmer basically means there's less antibody to bind to an acetylated version of these um, of these uh, histone H3s. So essentially, the bottom line is that, uh, and this is just uh, this data that's converted into um, graph graphical form, but essentially you have more acetylase activity if you put these five mutations into a mouse or into a wild type mouse uh, CERT 6 and that's you know equivalent to a beaver wild type and if you do the you know the, the follow-up experiment vice versa with you know making a beaver uh, version into a mouse version by just changing those five amino acids that they that are that are in that critical region that are basically the only different ones um, you you have you weaken the the acetylase activity of CERT T six right. So this is a structural analysis to show you basically where you know this is kind of the active site. So these amino acids kind of hang around this region. So they're you know they're you know, you know predicted to be important for for you know the enzymatic um, activity of this enzyme. Um, so. The AP, ADP ribosylase activity, so another function of, um, of uh, CERT-T6 is it uh, is a ribosyl, it has a ribosyl transferase activity. So if we look at mouse, these five mutations, this darker glob means that there's more, so this is um, an antibody against poly-ADP ribosylation. So you have more ADP uh, ribosylation um, happening at a target protein um, using a mouse uh, version that has these five mutations, you know, um, as compared to wild type mouse, and um, it's more similar to a beaver wild type. So basically, the ADP ribosylation status goes up, um, you know, for as far as the activity for this for this enzyme, as well as the histone deacetylase activity goes up, um, and you have a correlation with increased NHEJ activity. So basically, the you know the the Echo message here is that this uh, um, in vivo data using um, cells um, and also you know um, purified substrates shows that by reducing these five amino acid changes, which they identified using you know homology, you know looking at the you know the the different uh, homology you know basically sequence analysis uh, comparing the different sequences between the species and identifying the key region. Those five amino acids seem to be, um, you know, the most critical or the most important um, for conferring um, higher CERT six activity, uh, you know, um, between mouse and between beaver, right? Um, and the argument that the authors have made here is that, you know, that this that these key that these differences are key now. Um, to what is required for extending um, longevity uh, to, you know, the beaver versus the mouse. Um, you know, obviously the kind of the grand, I guess, um, experiment here would be, let's put these point mutations into a mouse and see if the mouse lives longer, right? So um, maybe the mouse will live longer. Um, Maybe not because you know you have other you have other CERT six has to interact with a whole bunch of other things that it's co-evolved with within the mouse background. But certainly that's plausible. Maybe you can put in mutations into uh, beaver mutations, maybe into a rat, and see if it lives longer. Of course, these are long experiments, right? Because even though a short even a short lived mouse, um, yes, so, so yes, so in a way, long lived species have more efficient CERT six CERT six variants. Um, uh, so they looked at rodents. Um, you know, obviously there's a lot of follow-up experiments you can you can do. Look at CERT six from a whole bunch of other stuff um, organisms out there, right? Galapagos turtles. Um, look at um, you know, obviously they focused on rodents because these are all of these organisms are the most evolutionary concern. Yeah, supercentenarians um, within humans. Um, so there's a lot of follow-up experiments, you know, and and in these mutations into into um, short-lived species, you know that's going to be a long experiment uh, out of necessity. Um, you could certainly do a lot of shorter-term um, 
experiments, if you do that kind of swapping experiment and see if, see if the mice are now more resistant to DNA damage, right, or, or other types of toxins short of having them live longer. Um, so I'm gonna share this oops, and scroll to, um, uh, so what they do here is, um, again, so they do these experiments and they show that uh, these cells are also more resistant to senescence. So they do, they basically look at beta galactosidase expression, um, which is a senescence marker in cells. So beta gal positive cells. Um, and they subject these cells to ionizing radiation measured in, you know, dosage called grays. Um, and the bottom line is that uh, by having, you know, so, look, so all of this data is staining for senescent cells. So if we look at percentage of beta galactosidase positive cells, no expression of STIR-T6, they're all get 90% mouse wild type. Um, a lot of senescent cells after ionizing radiation, um, you add in this mouse with the five mutations and it's like beaver wild type. You get a significant drop off in senescent cell or let's just say beta galactosidase expression, which is being used as a proxy for senescent cells. Um, and then if you put the mouse mutations into beaver, it jumps up again. So pretty, pretty good, you know, preliminary information. Um, and very, very, very interestingly here, this is now jumping from, from species, like going from, you know, across essentially, you know, um, you know, evolutionarily, we're talking millions and millions of years here, going from, you know, rodents to fruit flies. Um, so they, they express, um, so RE486, um, you know, it's, uh, it's a compound um, that has clinical applications, uh, but it's also, uh, it's used as a, as a chemical to switch on um, plasmids. So I'm not going to go over to the details here, but essentially um, you have fruit flies here, a survival curve, they're short-lived. Um, you have a control, which is not expressing these 36. You have mouse wild type mouse, you know, and I'm surprised they got this to work, but they, they have a mouse, um, you know, uh, with five mutations, beaver wild type, beaver five mutations, search six, um, expressed in fruit flies and Drosophila. Um, and by adding in this compound, you can switch on the expression. It's basically, it's an inducible plasma, or it, I think it's actually stably integrated. I have to, this is just, uh, oh, these are transgenic, so it's stably integrated integrated into these mice. So you can induce the expression of the gene, the transgene. Um, and they, they notice a, you know, uh, a significant increase. So maximal lifespan here, Peter's off to 70, goes up to 80 here. Um, I haven't done the digging here to see which strain of Drosophila they used and um, what the, you know, what the, what the averages are for lifespan. If this is a short-lived strain in general or a long-lived strain, you know, people who do lifespan studies are very picky about stuff like this. Um, but in this strain background here, um, expressing, you know, something as evolutionarily distinct as a mouse wild type. Um, so you're, you know, essentially overexpressing. So you get, you do get more SIR-T6, um, but these cells live longer. Mouse five mutations, even longer, beaver wild type even longer, and this kind of drops down. And, you know, according to this analysis here, these are significant. So you have an increase, um, you know, increase uh, of Drosophila lifespan by the expression of uh, mutagenized um, mouse, you know, um, sir T6 converted into a beaver form and the vice versa, you know, with, with the beaver which is pretty darned impressive um, considering the, you know, how evolutionarily distinct we are here. I'm going to the chat here. It would have been interesting to add, yeah, Steve says, add human strain C6 genes into the mice given how long lived we are. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, or maybe even to the Drosophila, right? Um, so, uh, so here I'm just kind of, Reading this text, generate transgenic Drosophila overexpressing mouse 36 beavers and a corresponding mutants using the 5CD31 integrase based transgenesis. So I'm just really impressed that they got this to work with, you know, um, 
you know, and of course they say remarkably in lifespan, it showed the beaver wild type extended a much greater extent mouse wild type. So yeah, I mean, what is most impressive to me, the most impressive about this is, you know, how evolutionarily conserved um, this truly is. If you can, if you can not only express, you know, mouse or T6 or any rodent or T6 in the Drosophila and get ex extension of lifespan, but be able to tease apart those five point mutations in a Drosophila background and be able to see that difference in a Drosophila background. Right, so that tells me that, okay, the worry I had about making these point mutations in a transgenic mouse, it shouldn't be a problem. If you can get this to work in a Drosophila, then something, you know, that's something that's in the same genus or the same, you know, order should not be, you know, you should expect, you should expect that uh, experiment to work, you know, since it's so evolutionarily conserved. Um, so yeah, um, there's, a, you know, I think we're gonna end it uh, at, on that because that's the last figure for the paper um, as far as the official figures are concerned on the paper itself. There's a lot of supplemental figures that I did not go over uh, where they do a lot of other assays, um, you know, kind of hammering the point of the importance of SIR-T6. Um, but I think, um, you know, I, I really love this paper because um, it really, um, explained a lot, I think, uh, made a pretty convincing case evolutionarily. So, you know, uh, I think a famous, well, famous biologist in the past of Chomsky said, nothing can be understood in the context, or nothing can be understood in biology, you know, without the context of evolution, right? So it all has to, you know, it, that's evolution or evolution by natural selection or some sort of selection, artificial or natural, um, is the driving force for, for or how pathways basically come come to being, um, and you know this paper really um, looked at evolutionary biology as a central driving force, um, and a central drives for a longevity mechanism, which is you know which is in, which has SIR T six you know upstream of it. Um, so um, so. Bottom line is this paper set a very high bar, I think, for a lot of other papers that will, in, that will uh, hopefully also address um, how evolution um, and natural selection um, evolved longevity mechanisms um, in of all the various species. Um, because of course, you know, um, environment is the driving force, you know, and, uh, Mice are obviously short-lived, but they're successful in their habitat. They procreate, they breed. So they've been around for, 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 for quite a long time as, as beavers have, which are, which are long-lived. So, you know, these are all just different strategies to promote the population. Um, so, um, so putting evolution in a kind of a central place as a driving force for all these longevity mechanisms and explaining and using that to explain how these you know, how these differences may, may have arisen. Um, that's, I think, is going to be very central to, um, to uh, explaining uh, longevity mechanisms and aging across all species and organisms on planet Earth. So yeah, uh, really enjoyed this paper. It is rather a large, technically impressive paper. Um, isn't it really? Um, I can't believe they uh, managed to to achieve some of the stuff in the fruit flies. Uh, would love to yeah. see. Uh, yeah, I was surprised. More. I was surprised it just like came out of left field, and it's like, and it works in fruit flies, you know, with these five mutations. And I'm like, what? I'm like, that's all right. Um, so, yeah. So fascinating, fascinating in that um, you know all all cert genes are not equal and and it varies in the species at how how efficient they are so i can only imagine that in humans the cert 6 gene must be highly efficient um and in in the bowhead whale i'm sure there's yeah. probably um 
uh, an analog, if not yeah. a direct version yeah. of it. I, it must yeah. be super, super efficient. Yeah, and I would, I would, I would, you know, and to find out, to further add more complexity to this and muddy the water maybe a little bit, you know, if if people don't see such a correlation, they might need to look a little deeper because you know, sirt six interacts with other enzymes, so it. You know, the difference might, in certain long-lived species, I'm just tossing this out there, the difference not, might not be in SIRT6 directly, but with a partner it interacts with, which then mediates the response. So you can have, so, you know, it's, um, there's a lot to unpack, but I, I you know, it's, uh, it's surprising to me that this one enzyme, which is upstream of both NHEJ and, and HR, they were able to actually show such a strong correlation um, with lifespan, with repair capability, um, you know, just just starting starting off with that. I mean, it, it could have easily gone down the rabbit hole really quickly, and and they would have had to, you know, it showed no correlation, and 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 it's and and but there is a correlation, but it's because of a secondary mm. enzyme that SIRT6 interacts with, and then then it'll take another ten to twenty to thirty years to tease <laughs> that out. But but the fact that they managed to show that at least in in rodents. You had this strong correlation and it was very explainable um you know so i i at least for me the key this this further validates that the you know that uh that longevity mechanisms you know uh, are what evolved in a variety of organisms um that it's not um it's you know aging and longevity is not an intractable problem there are you know Evolutionary biology organisms like to reuse the same things over and over again. So, you know, seeing this work in Drosophila and seeing seeing all of this work in the different you know different rodents um, cements for me that uh, you know that these are these are tractable problems. That uh, you know that it's there's not infinite complexity. That there are constraints with which biology operates under. And we can we can figure out um, what's what's taking place. Yeah. That you know that the types of damage and breakdowns that can happen could be myriad and almost infinite. But the processes by which evolution figured out how to fix these problems are very limited. And that and 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 we can we can get a handle on those. I mean, it, it'll be hard, but it's tractable. Yeah, it's not. It it's not some insurmountable mystery never to be solved yeah. like some people once suggested uh, and again that also um is relevant to the actual aging damages and errors as well sure you know there are quite a a, a, a large selection of them but they only sort of they do fit into sort of very sort of broad categories or hallmarks and there are solutions potentially to all of them so it's just a matter of sort of working out the specifics and we're getting there. And as you say, the, the body's already adapted to deal with a lot of it itself. So it, it's very, it's just, it's just fascinating really. The, the paper really is very interesting. And I honestly think it's, it's another nail in the coffin for the whole death program ideas that people have suggested in the past. I, I really don't think we're, we're, we're not programmed to die we're programmed to survive. Yeah. It's just that different species are better or worse in the way that they're programmed. For example, humans and more advanced uh, life forms compared to, say, uh, uh, you know, a fruit fly, um, we've adapted a lot more redundancy in the system. So in humans in particular, we find there's a lot of redundancy in our repair systems. Our immune system is a great example of where... Uh, there are immune cells that have crossovers, for example, you know, they, 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 if there are not enough of one type of immune cell to do a particular repair job, then others take up the slack. Um, so more complex organs, uh, you know, organ, organs, more complex organisms, I should say, like us, have obviously adapted a lot more redundancy. So, yeah, I'm definitely going to think that we've got better cert six, for example. Yeah. Well, I mean, the bottom line is, given given the environment, environmental niche of a particular organism evolved in for the longest period of time, you just need to live long enough to procreate. That's that's it, and 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 um, and to keep one step ahead of entropy, and if that means procreating, 
every 30 minutes or procreating once every 200 years. Whatever that strategy happens to be, you know, that's the strategy that uh, works in the long run for that particular organism in that particular environmental niche um, with that particular metabolic capacity and, you know, and so on. So that's, yeah. So I think we're, uh, we're, we're st steadily moving towards um, that consent that we uh, we keep talking about. I know a lot of people laugh at the idea that there'll be consensus on what aging is, but I don't know. I, I don't think we're that far away. And I, I, I know you've mentioned it a few times. You know, I can see a time in the next 10 years, 20 years, 10 years, certainly where a lot of these unresolved issues about program versus damage. I think I think a lot of those things are going to be resolved. Yeah. Um, but, but there we are. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of these paradoxes also end up being, you know, like the old parable about uh, the, the the blind guys and the elephant, right? Yeah. They basically, and, and it's and I think they addressed. I think you know, and I'm hoping it it, it holds up, and I'm and there should be more follow up experiments with you know explaining why certain you know certain types of damage repair correlate with aging and others don't, based on evolutionary biology, and. Um, and you know, it's uh, hopefully the waters will get clearer and clearer, and it, they they appear to be getting clear. Um, but you know, you never know. I'm I'm being optimistic here. That's that's me. I'm optimistic that uh, along with Steve, that um, I think uh, things are starting to crystallize, um, and there's there's less. At least it appears mm. during the 19 years that I've been, you know, since I started grad school and left that things have gotten clearer and not muddier um, certainly over the years although they always say uh, one thing um, a physicist friend of mine actually said was the more you drill down into physics the more simple it gets the more you drill down into biology the more complex it gets so I always I was uh, re reminded of that but broadly I think the there are some primary yeah. processes, which get, again goes back to the errors, the hallmarks, the damages, whatever you want to call them. And I think we're going to get there. And, uh, we're going to get to the point where I wouldn't say totally understand aging, but I think we're going to be able to do something about it. Well, we already can in in various species. Yeah. So, and I'm gonna. Yeah. So I'm I'm waiting. <laughs> I'm waiting for that day, really, Oliver. Uh, when can I have my upgrade? Oh, I'm I'm going to even make another <laughs> another big picture. Or, or, or high level prediction and say mm. that I think mm. um, the equity pathways to maintain, you know, to maintain the, um, to basically prevent aging, prevent, you know, clear up damage. Um, if, you know, they're not only evolutionary very old, but they're probably the oldest pathways and they probably um, had to originate at, at, I would say at the very origins of life itself. That, uh, that damage repair mechanisms had to have started almost, you know, I'll put my foot out there and probably before life, before we've been recognized as life, early mechanisms that uh, early metabolic pathways that, that, that led to life because um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say that, you know, every, every chemical pathway has side products which can basically prevent the pathway from operating. And if you want to have certain pathways operating, you have to be able to get rid of your unwanted side reactions and you have to be able to, to mitigate those, that damage. Otherwise, your, your whole reaction is going to cease, whatever that reaction is. So I would, I would say that, that probably if we drill down even deeper and deeper and deeper into the evolutionary past, I think, I think, um, pathways that maintain longevity um, may have been necessary for life itself to begin. So, yeah. I'm definitely uh, on the idea of longevity program rather than death programs. I think there's absolutely, uh, well, the evidence is absolutely supporting that. So, fascinating. But we, uh, we really should uh, get some of the authors together and we should, uh, we should see if they're up for a, uh, a webinar so we can delve a little bit deeper into that um hopefully uh our, our uh, audience and 
uh, supporters will be interested in something like that. I know I would. So uh, yeah, let's uh, let's see if we can get the wheels turning on that. I'm just so, I'm just, you know. I'm just uh, googling bats and telomeres. Um, yeah. Anyway, something to do with uh, yeah. Uh, bats don't produce telomerase things. Uh, telomere. Anyway, I'm gonna. I'll uh, I'll do some more readings on, on bats and telomeres before our, our next. Uh, you know. Alt. It'll be alt uh, that they use. Yeah, it's, uh, Oliver. Yeah, it's, it's probably that. It's, or um, but, the alternate yeah. length yeah. of telomeres. So I, th I think yeah. that was something that they were talking about uh, onco sends and why bats were quite interesting from a cancer research mm -hmm. point of view. So. But we already know now very recently from Maria Blasco, who was at the conference as well, that it's not the length of telomeres, it's the rate of shortening. That's the important factor in longevity and directly, very, very directly correlates the lifespan. So and, that's another and, great yeah. potential biomarker. Yeah, and this and this ties in nicely with this work here because mice mm. need to have longer telomeres because their telomeres degrade faster. And it's probably because they have worse repair path so this might be yeah. you know this might be a, a, a ad hoc evolutionary approach for the mice to deal with if they don't have the right enzymes to maintain mm. telomere lengths what solution will the evolutionary come up with longer telomeres right so it's so you know like so. um yeah, yeah so mm -hmm. so within you know so it all has to make sense within the context of evolutionary biology so i think um i think with that i have nothing more to add for today's journal no, I think it was great. Um, so fascinating paper, um, lots to think about, and uh, that's great. So uh, yeah, so I think we'll uh, wrap it up here, and we'll t we'll uh, come back with um, another another topic next time. And obviously, thanks to everybody that's come along and uh, joined in and watched today, and uh, a special mention to the lifespan heroes who make. Uh, episodes like this possible and if you'd like to learn more about that uh, if, you, if you can visit lifespan.io forward slash heroes find out how to uh, support support this show and, and the various other things like the life extend show uh, which also runs on uh, on youtube and the many other things that we do so uh, do check that out and we'll announce the uh, the next episode of journal club shortly we don't know what it is although i have made my suggestion oliver i will reach out but to we'll, uh, we'll re yeah oh well we we may be doing that new paper then and we will reveal all in due course okay so thank you dear listeners we will catch you next time all right take hey. care everybody take care